All right, fantastic. Well, I just want to welcome everyone to our fall author series. Um, the fall series is titled We Are Learning From You. Um, this is funded by Diné College and the Mellon Foundation. Um, today we have our book talk um, for the book Carbon Sovereignty, Coal Development and Energy Transition in the Navajo Nation by Dr. Andrew Curley. And I'll go ahead and let him actually introduce himself, but um, just a note for all the Facebook um, viewers, we are going to be sharing the link to purchase the book from University of Arizona Press. Um, so we're, we're really um, proud to have Dr. Andrew Curley come back to Diné College since he actually used to be employed by DC. So uh, I just want to give uh, Mr. Andrew Curley a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Gray Eyes. Uh, thank you, Diné College, for uh, inviting me here and hosting me and giving me an opportunity to present uh, my work, Carbon Sovereignty. It's good to be back here. Um, as uh, Dr. Gray Eyes was saying, worked here a long time ago and uh, really started to develop my interest in the material that eventually becomes uh, the basis for this book in, um, in my initial uh, work here um, 15, 16 years ago. I forget exactly. I'm not doing math well right now. I didn't do math classes here, <laughs> apparently. So, um, uh, yate, uh, I'm Andrew Curley, Bilagana Nishle, Hanagatni, Basachin, Bilaganda, Shache, Kiani, Dashanali. I am. Um, well, my, my, I'm an urban Indian. <laughs> I live in Tucson. I uh, work at the, uh, the School of Geography, Development, and Environment at the University of Arizona. And, um, and my, my work has been about the history of coal mining and development in the Navajo Nation, particularly around the Western Agency coal, coal fields that are now closed but had been a, a big part of that, that economy for a while. And, um, and now I'm looking more at water rights and, and infrastructure and water infrastructure and thinking about how that uh, impacts our, our tribal nation. So do I just ask you to move the slides when I'm ready? Okay. All right. So we'll move to the next slide. That's my, uh, uh, so what I'm going to be doing is presenting a chapter from my book. So this is the larger text and, you know, I included this in the slide just to give you a sense of the, the material I cover. Uh, I do some stuff about what, my, what I mean by carbon sovereignty, and I'll, I'll introduce that concept to you in a moment. Um, also talk about uh, leases and, and how I, I argue that leases, uh, coal leases are like treaties and they have treaty-like features. And importantly, what I'm going to talk about are the workers, um, the workers' perspectives of coal. And that I think is what is most innovative of this work. It's not the only book about coal in Navajo Nation, but what I was trying to do in this research project was to think about how people who participated in that industry or were uh, community members that were affected directly by the people working in that industry were thinking about these issues. So that was my task. Um, I was trying to move away from just environmentalist narratives or developmentalist narratives and then think about workers' narratives. So that was that was the main research approach. So those are the those are the the topics that I've talked about in this book. And finally I end on the issue of energy transition and to think about where energy what this story, this history of coal tells us about the prospects for energy transition in the Navajo Nation and in a general sense in the United States more generally. So next slide. So what I mean by carbon sovereignty is kind of a, a nebulous concept, right? It's something that's hard to, to understand up front. But I really take my um, work from political anthropologist Timothy Mitchell, who, who wrote this book in 2009 called Carbon Democracy. And he, his book was an inversion of a resource curse thesis. So I, that's the, those are a lot of words. So I'll try to explain what all of those things mean. So a resource curse is an economic way of thinking about it. It's coming from the economic literature, like economists talk about this. And they say, uh, they're looking at this, this phenomenon of developing nations, particularly in Africa. And they're saying places that have a lot of extractive resources that are resource rich tend to have underdeveloped economies. Um, and whatever they mean by underdeveloped, that's, you know, a whole debated criteria that economists have. You know, they have those kinds of conversations. But what 
Mitchell argues, coming from an opposite perspective, is to say everything that's part of that nation was built from revenues coming from, in the, in the case of, um, of the Gulf, like oil and gas, but particularly oil, like he, he works in the Middle East, so he's thinking about Arabia, he's thinking of North Africa, and how a lot of those governments, a lot of those nations have built institutions based on revenues coming from extracted resources. So he's saying state making, the ability to do things in your country was made possible by these extractive industries. So it's not to say that they're cursed by them, but that they're actually the basis for state making in these places. So I thought that was an interesting way to look at our own tribal communities, especially places like the Navajo Nation, where we've had almost every kind of extractive resource possible um, developed or, or extracted from, from our lands. Uranium, gas, oil, coal, um, those are pretty much everything that you see across Indian country. So those are the things that, you know, we've have a long uh, history of, of working within extractive industries and to think about how our tribal institutions, our tribal government in Window Rock, possibly Diné College, a lot of other, uh, like our policing, a lot of the things that we use as functions of our state, you know, that are part of our civil society uh, in, uh, in the Navajo Nation, how those things are supported through a relationship with carbon uh, intensive materials, things that re in this case, they emit carb a lot of carbon and are part of um, the contributions of greenhouse gases and, and those kinds of things. And I think what's interesting about the idea of carbon, it's not only a source of energy, but it's also a source of um, agitation. So people are thinking about carbon in a way that they want to reduce it. They want to move against the continuation of greenhouse gases. So it's a mobilizing force, both in terms of the revenues that are derived from it and also the ideological meaning that is that comes from it, from uh, the way that environmental groups and other um, tribal members have thought through the issue of uh, of, of our place in gre in greenhouse gas production and 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 thinking about the future of the planet and how we want to live on the planet. So I, it's a mobilizing idea. It's a mobilizing force. And I and what I'm arguing here is it's like our ideas of sovereignty and self determination are defined through our our evolving relationship around carbon. So that's the, this is coming from the text in the book. Dene people express a sense of carbon sovereignty in their mobilization for or against, there's a typo here, he renewal, the renewal of a coal-fired power plant lease. Carbon sovereignty is the social and political relation in the reservation that are defined through energy projects. So it's about the social and political. These are the domains that I'm looking at. Okay, next slide. Uh, my methodology was I interviewed 42 people across the reservation. I particularly focus on environmental activists and organizers, tribal officials, and coal workers. Those are the people I, I, I argue are defining the debate around coal and, uh, and extraction in the Navajo Nation, at least in 2013 when I was doing this research. And then I do a lot of historical work. And I went to the archives of the Carl Hayden papers and uh, at ASU, Stuart Udall at ASU, um, no, Stuart Udall at U of A and Peter Iverson papers at, at ASU, and, um, and then other things, materials related to Central Arizona Project, a lot of that was at, at, um, at ASU library, so I was going there. Uh, some of that stuff is at NAU too, but, um, but the, these are the primary papers I was looking at. Okay, next slide. All right, just to give you a sense of how extraction has embedded itself in Indian nations. This is a map that I, I produced, um, I think it was around 20, 2014, but it's coming, you can do this yourself. Go to the Energy Information Agency and you just create two. gas and oil fields are. So the extractive pressure is beneath our surface, right? This is where a lot of the um, non-renewable energy sources are found beneath our reservation lands. You see there's a lot of it in the northeast corner of the Navajo Nation. Okay, next slide. And similarly, we have a lot of coal, and this is where a lot of the coal reserves are, are located, and that's where these gray shadows are. 
here and we can see in Montana, there's a lot of overlap reservations directly over coal fields. And in the Navajo Nation, we have some on the eastern end of the reservation in the Black Mesa area in the center of the reservation. It's hard, harder to see the distinction here because of the purple and the gray color colors, but that's, that's what's, uh, what's located there. Okay, next slide. Uh, one of the things that I try to emphasize in my in my um, argument about carbon sovereignty and this broader idea of energy impacts on Indian reservations, on tribal on federally recognized tribal lands, like those reservation boundaries that I showed you, is that the that the uh, the pressures are not homogenous. There's boom and bust happening. There's pressures to develop oil while there's a collapse of a coal industry happening. So the energy transition is having uneven effects across Indian country. So you have here, this is a, um, um, this is a chart that's, uh, a table, sorry, that shows you the decline or the increase of the total percentage of oil produced on reservations between 2003 and 2014. That was at 0.5% the beginning of the century to about almost 2% by 2014. And then coal, as you can see, is declining from a high of 3% of total U.S. production to 1.9 at 2014. And this is before the Canton mine closed, which is one of the largest, I think the largest coal mine in, the, in, in Indian country. And so that would have brought it down significantly more uh, uh, since then. I wasn't able to replicate this or to move the, uh, the table further beyond 2014. I've looked all over the EIA website, they don't really produce this data anymore. So I, I got a different set of numbers. Next slide. And that's just to show you the decline of coal production across the United States and Native American lands in total um, over the 20 year period. So you have 20, 2005 here to 2020, you can see that it's a steady decline. And in the US it's almost a complete collapse after 2018. So there's a huge shift away from coal both in Indian country and in the United States. And that's just shown here. This is coming from the, the natural resource revenue data. Okay, next slide. So the way that I think is helpful for us to understand it, what is unique about uh, reservations is the law, the structuring laws of federal Indian policy over the last uh, century, a uh, century and almost a half at this point. So um, if you look at like David Wilkins and Vine Deloria and the way they talk about federal in American Indian policy, I think is what, how they describe it. Over um, a period of time from 1840s up until today, they describe it as oscillating back and forth between expanding rights and taking rights away. And there's, there, you can see this reflected uh, on the side of the table here that I created. So these are the actual legislations or congressional acts that define the features of federal Indian law today. And, I, and so we often, like if you're Native American studies or in Diné studies, we're talking about this. We're talking about these political structures. So we're talking about the assimilationist era in the General Allotment Act and how land was alienated from tribes uh, through that policy. And then how that was uh, arrested in 1934 with the passage of the Indian Reorganization Act, which created a central tribal government for the first time in the Navajo Nation. Uh, well, <laughs> it created the centralized government that we have today in the Navajo Nation. We were just having a conversation earlier about the difference between the 1923 Council and the 1934 Council, um, or what came after 1934. And then, of course, the Indian Self-Determination Act and this nation-to-nation uh, -nation, uh, executive memo uh, that Clinton uh, gave in 1994. These are basically expanding the authorities that are existent, that are redefined through the, the IRA, the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934. Now, what I think is important that we often neglect is a development policy on this end that is, that is reflecting, that is uh, reflecting the, the policy on, on the other end. So this is a political structure. This is the way the economic development was envisioned from from congressmen and usually men uh, who were deciding, you know, the fate of tribes throughout the last uh, century and a half. So during the assimilationist era, there was an emphasis on individual leasing. And that was where like you had an allotment, you had, mo you had minerals beneath it. You can, you would negotiate with those mineral companies directly or a BIA official 
Office of Indian Agency official would negotiate on your behalf for those revenues, for those leasing rights. And that became the, some of the, the neglect and the mismanagement of that became the basis of the Cobell litigation that was uh, settled around 2014, 15, around that time. And then uh, 1938, this is what's important for us, is Indian Mineral Leasing Act, which gives the councils that were created in the 30s of the authority to lease lands for subterranean mineral development, for oil, uranium, gas, uh, coal. So those authorities are coming out of that Congressional Act in 1938. And over the next uh, 60 years, those authorities are just expanded to, uh, to give tribes more, more uh, direct decision-making power and less oversight from DOI, the Div Department of Interior. That's basically what you're doing here. So the 30s are a very important decade when we're thinking about uh, tribal federal Indian law and economic development policy. Okay, next slide. Um, one thing that I was emphasizing in our conversation earlier and that I've started to incorporate more into these presentations is the futile, futile, futile how do you say that? Futile? Futility. Futility. All right. My English is terrible. <laughs> Futility of, um, of trying to predict the future. So I'm speaking directly against uh, the whole profession of economics, which is basically, <laughs> I always call it like a pseudoscience, like fortune telling. But um, because you're not looking at something empirical, you're looking at something projected. Anyway, so like this is uh, coming from Norman Little. How many of you have heard of Norman Little before? Raise your hand. <laughs> Marley. Norman Little used to live in Winter Rock. I think he probably solicited the tennis courts that used to be there that I don't know where they're at now. The BIA used to maintain these kinds of things. And um, he was our tribal attorney. So as you, he's a non-native guy, uh, in case you couldn't tell from, the, <laughs> from this picture. And he was hired by the tribe in the 1950s. And it was very controversial, actually. He was, um, he w there was one faction of that council that was very supportive of what he's doing. But then when Raymond Nakai came in, he was very much opposed to the, the kinds of uh, authority and the hubris that he had, the way he was advising the council. Anyway, he, what he was doing in the, in the early 60s when he was employed by the tribal council, was he was also advising economic development policy. How many of you have ever heard of an attorney trying to give you economic development advice? That's not, that seems like a, like a foreign concept on the Navajo Nation, right? I'm just teasing. That's actually a very, pretty regular practice. So what, <laughs> so what happens is he's saying in 1966, at the time when the tribal council is they're, what they're doing is they're withdrawing leases, uh, they're withdrawing support for hydroelectric dams along the Colorado River and supporting a new withdrawal of lease uh, for what would eventually become the Navajo Generating Station. And what Norman Little is telling the council in 1966 is, long after all of us have left this mortal world, coal will still be going strong, but when it does run out, you have thermonuclear power which can create and generate electric power far cheaper than hydropower. So what I think is important about this and why I'm emphasizing this quote is because not only is it influencing tribal decision-making around coal at the origin of the Kayenta mine and the Navajo generating station, but it's also predicting the future of energy transition. One that was completely wrong, in fact, over the last, uh, the uh, subsequent uh, 70 years since then, where thermal nuclear power is not uh, an industry that ever picked up for various reasons, uh, why nuclear power production didn't eventually become the dominant energy uh, energy source in the in the United States, but that was what they were predicting in the in the 1960s, and it's not just on the Navajo Nation. Throughout much of the United States, energy conversations were about nuclear power. And so it makes us think about how we're talking about energy transition today, how we have future projected in, um, technologies that we think will be um, the replacement of uh, fossil fuel or, fossil, or, or carbon intensive uh, types of energy production. And I think it makes us really reflect and reconsider how much we think we know is going to happen in the future. And, I, and, and so I, this, is a, this whole thing is to um, emphasize that there was a milieu, there was a particular way of thinking about coal in the 1960s, which contributed to the establishment of the industry in the way that it eventually played out and, and creates the conditions for why it collapsed the way it did uh, in, in the last few years. So 
that's just something to think about and that I, I like to include that. And that's in my, what, one of the chapters I talk more extensively about this. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this is a map that, um, uh, that shows you exactly where I was working. And most of you probably are familiar with the Navajo Nation. So uh, Kayenta and the Navajo Generator Station, these things were linked together by a rail line and everything that was produced here went to uh, Navajo Generator Station. So those two projects were in intricately linked uh, in terms of the coal that was produced and the energy that was created from it. Next slide. I'll try to go a little bit quicker. Um, one thing I was trying, I try to emphasize is like our current reservation is outside of the boundaries of traditional Diné um, land claims, you know, going all the way up to our four sacred mountains that are defining the eastern, northern, western boundaries, and then elsewhere where there's been known settlements of Diné people. Uh, so our reservation is actually smaller than our historical land claims. And so we're, uh, we're actually working with, uh, that's just a, a point that I try to make the non-native readers. And so I included that map in there. Next slide. So one of the pressures that are um, existent with coal, especially during the renewal in 2013, when I was doing the research, the, 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 the renewal of the Navajo gener the proposed renewal of the Navajo generating station was amount of revenues that was being uh, produced through coal for the tribal government. So for those of you who don't know, our tribal government has two different kinds of ways of thinking about money. There's federal revenues and non-federal revenues. The federal revenues are things that are earmarked that have to be spent in a certain way. It's coming from the federal government. If you're getting, if you're 638 contracting and you're like, we are going to maintain our own police force, the money that otherwise would fund a Bureau of Indian Affairs police force goes to Navajo Nation to run its own police force. But that money can't be moved into other categories. It can't be moved to social spending that we might think we need. Like, oh, we need to improve roads. Let's take that money that otherwise goes to the police and put it towards roads. That can't be done for non for federal revenue. So, so anything that we want to do on our own, we have to get derived from non-federal revenues. And those come in the sources of revenues from extractive resources like coal, oil, and gas, or from leasing land uh, like Big Bokeas <laughs> to ranchers, and, uh, and taxes like our fuel excise tax and other kinds of sales tax derived on the reservation. So the point of this pie chart is to show that coal in, in its various sources was 24% of non-federal revenue. So that's almost a quarter of the budget for discretionary funding for things that go towards like scholarships or that go towards um, if, if, uh, if roads need to be improved or if, uh, if, if we want to give some money towards um, uh, elder care at the chapter house. You know, those kinds of things would be coming out of that out of that particular budget. So there's a pressure and also tribal employees, you know, tribal employees are employed through these revenues. So there's a pressure to continue the industry in order to just maintain what you got. And in order to have enough revenues to take care of a lot of the things that need to be done around here, right? The, to, to fix a lot of the infrastructure that needs to be repaired. Next slide. Um, you know, I like, to put pictures of people <laughs> and events on on uh, the PowerPoint because uh, we talk a lot in abstraction, and you actually have to see you know the way that these uh, things play out. And that uh, one of the things that I thought was really um, that I thought about, like especially around 2017 and 2018, when we knew that the Kanta mine was going to close and the NGS power plant was going to decommission was um, was was extreme like kind of anxiety and existential crisis that a lot of people in the communities faced. And so this is actually a picture I took at the Kayenta chapter during my field research uh, while community members were deliberating uh, their stance. There was a chapter resolution to talk about whether or not they support the renewal of the Navajo generating station. And there was a lot of people speaking to the issue from the community uh, members of coal coal workers or former coal workers who were retired saying, you know, this was a source of jobs and um, something that they used to maintain their families. Uh, other people who were saying were, were extolling or talking about the environmental impacts, you know, there it's nearby for them. It's not too far away. There's a, um, there's a, you know, a mine site that has changed permanently altered even people's former grazing land. So that's a big issue for a lot of people. Um, and then there's uh, and then there's people talking about and few people talking about like the 
the longer, the larger impacts that the tribe has on greater questions of climate change and, and CO2s and that sort of thing. And so it becomes a really important conversation for community members. And I think like it's really grounded for us on the Navajo Nation. Like we're really thinking through coal energy in all of its facets. Whereas for people like who are benefiting from it more directly, people in Phoenix and Tucson where I live, it's all abstract. It's just like, oh, what's on my energy bill and how much am I paying in energy? So one time at the Kayenta Township, I don't have a picture of that. Everybody's talking about like the collapse of the industry and what the Navajo Nation needs to do. There was like four council delegates there hearing community testimony. And now this was on a Saturday. And I was thinking, look, here we are having to deal with this issue while Phoenix is just like, they don't even know that this is kind of an anxiety. This is an issue that the Navajo Nation has to face, right? Because our relationship with coal is really dependent where they can just switch to a different energy source and they won't even make, it won't even, they won't even notice it. So that's something that I think is really important to, to, to highlight is that these are real impacts on people and community members and are things that you know, any kind of energy, and so what it tells us is any kind of energy, any kind of development project we have are going to have real social political consequences. We're going to have very uh, deliberative processes. It's going to be something that becomes embedded in our in our social fabric. And that's an important thing that I try to highlight in, in this book is to think about the social impact of, of coal mining over 60 years. Okay, next slide. Um, so here's some of the infrastructure left behind when I, at 2013, when I was doing the research, this is from the, the slurry from the former uh, Black Mesa mine. Um, next slide. Um, this was a, a sign posted outside of the former Chevron mine uh, uh, or the McKinley mine outside of Window Rock and between Window Rock and Gallup. And you can see like, you know, at this time there was uh, 17 days without a loss of time or accident. And, one thing I think this um, sign reminds us about is the danger, you know, in this kind of work. It's not like me going to like this, you know, my, the greatest danger I have is that I'll embarrass myself or say something stupid. <laughs> Whereas, uh, um, you know, people there, you know, some people actually die uh, working in these things. I actually look at reports, you know, from the Peabody Coal that like, were people suing the, the coal company because somebody fell, injured themselves, permanently uh, injured or, or, or pa perhaps uh, passed away. So these are, this is arduous work. It's difficult. It has real like impact on family members. So there's one coal worker that I interviewed who was saying how, like, even though they live in the same home, you know, that person rarely saw their family because they had the like, overnight shift. So like, well, everybody else was doing day stuff, you know, going to school during the day, living, and then they would be asleep while, um, they would, the guy would be sleeping while they were out uh, doing their day work, and then he would be working while they were sleeping. So you live in the same space, but there's this temporal disjuncture, right? Because they're doing, you're not active at the same time, and that has an impact on your family. All right, next slide. So one of the things that I thought was really like encapsulated what I thought was a, a larger sense of, uh, of work and livelihood, and just the, the thing that I was trying to get at in this research was one particular interview I had with a, with a coworker who had been there for decades in the industry. And I call him David, because I, I told them that I wasn't going to, or him, that I wasn't going to reveal his name in the, in the research. But uh, this is a quote that I take from an interview I had with him. And he was referring to the Navajo Nation Council at the time. So when they were thinking about the lease renewal, he was saying like, the Navajo Nation Council doesn't support us and here's the reasons why. And he says, already they are prejudiced because we are practicing what our great grandmas and great grandpa said, ah, it's going to be up to you to be something. We are not practicing what those councilmen over there are doing, just sitting around and going to bars. <laughs> no, we are doing what we are told. Ah, go in, get up in the morning and make some money. Good things will come to you. We get up early in the morning and come back and we brought a little bit of progress. So I think this is reflective of, of his idea of what the industry does, what, how it's a community benefit, and also how it represents or how the, how the work is similar to uh, a Diné value system that he grew up on. And so one thing that I think is interesting about this quote is what is he referencing back to? And he's referencing back to his grandmas and grandpas, which were, and at that time, this 
this man is like 60 years old. He's like, so his gra grandma and grandpas would be like 40 years prior to that, maybe in the 40s to the 50s. So at a time pre-coal, more subsistence activity, more livestock, more farming. Uh, and that's where this value comes from. It's coming out of this, what we call in the social sciences, subsistence economy. And it's about living on the land in a certain way, you know, doing the necessary work to survive on a land without a lot of infrastructure, without water coming to your home or electricity coming to your home, you have to actually get out and do work. So that's, that's the broader meaning that he is conveying. Now, the other thing I argue in this book is that that's his perspective on this concept, but this concept is plural. It has multiple meaning for different people. So at the same time, an environmental organizer might argue against this uh, definition or a tribal official might argue against this definition. This is a contemporary political idea. It's not something in the past, it's part of our politics today. And this is one way that that political idea is expressed. Okay, next slide. So the larger point that I derive from his quote is that, that this idea that was, that was learned over generations from a subsistence economy makes its way into a wage labor economy. So this is kind of the sociological interest that I had. Like, how do people moving away from direct relationship with the land, they're working on the land, but in a very different way uh, in, in the coal work. And the kind of benefit they get is coming in the forms of money, right? Salary or not salary or wages. And so, the, you're, and so there's a lot of sociological literature about the alienation of labor, about how people become like, lose uh, something about themselves when they move into wage labor type of work. And what I think is interesting about the Navajo coal worker experience is they're able to translate some values that are coming from a subsistence lifestyle or a pre-coal lifestyle in this case into this wage labor economy. And so they reconfigure the values into a contemporary context. And I think that's important to recognize. And so that's something that you know, I'm arguing is happening or did happen. It's a social phenomenon that happened in the case of coal in the particular way that it was described and understood by the workers that I interviewed. And these are pictures that I took outside of uh, the tribal council in 2013 when workers were, um, were there uh, trying to, to get the council to renew the lease for uh, NGS. And this guy is not native. This guy's name is George Hardeen. <laughs> he used to work for NGS. I think he works for Boo now. Boo, does George work for you? I don't know. We can ask. So anyway, so these are, uh, he's kind of like really prominent in the foreground. It's always kind of annoying me. That's former delegate Dwight Witherspoon. So he's out there hearing out all of these co-workers here. Okay, next slide. Uh, one of the other things that uh, uh, I, want, I also emphasize or talk about is like some of the legacies of coal. Now, you know, at the time I was thinking about like, what are the social issues that people are talking about? What is the phenomenon being produced? So now by the time I finished writing this book, the whole, the mine closed and the power plant was demolished. In fact, that's the ending, right? Like the ending is the cover, which is kind of interesting. It's the demolishment of the power plant. And you can think about it in terms of like, here are some of the legacies. There's jobs lost. There was 440 at a peak. You know, by the time you got to 2019, 265 people, employed uh, at the mine and, or in the mine and, and power plant combined. Sorry, that's how we did that. Uh, there's a lot of water that was lost over the, the, the years that, um, that both the Black Mesa mine and the Kayenta mine were operating. As many of you might be aware, the Black Mesa mine used a coal slurry to move the coal from, uh, from the mine site to the, to the power plant, which was in Laughlin, Nevada. And so that was depleting about 1,200 acre feet of groundwater per year uh, for the Navajo aquifer. Oh no, that was a Sikayenta mine. And then the Black Mesa mine was 3 million gallons of water. So that's non-renewable water, right? That's water that, or harder to recharge. That's stuff that's been there for centuries built up and then it's been depleted really quickly through this mining activity. So we can consider that a water loss. And then one of the things that I think we don't, uh, we don't talk enough about is a land loss. So when we look at that map that I showed you, uh, we look at the contiguous Navajo Nation and think this is all our reservation. But when you utilize some of your land in a particular way, and in this case, you make it toxic, it's hard to use that land in other ways. And so that's part of the dilemma we have with both, the, both of these mine sites. So Kayenta mine was about 44,000 acres and Black Mesa mine about 20,000 acres. And how do you and can you reuse those lands for other purposes? 
early in my research, I was at a chapter meeting in Pinyon, and there we had a representative from Peabody, we had a representative from Black Mesa Water Coalition, we had a representative from uh, Black Mesa United. I don't know if you've heard of that group. And the Black Mesa United people were saying, this is our grazing, these are historically our grazing lands, and we want them back. You know, we want them now that there's no longer coal, we want to return them back to our to like our family, our family lands. But can you build houses on those? Can you graze sheep on those lands? Uh, the law requires that they follow that the, the company actually oversees the restoration of those lands for 10 years. So right now they still couldn't, or at that time they couldn't access those lands anyway. But even when that period elapses, would you still be able to do certain kinds of activities on that? So I think that's something we need to consider is the land loss through some of these activities. We have a number of uh, Superfund sites from uranium mining, right? The all dotting throughout the reservation. So those, even though we have on our map, this contiguous reservation, land is functionally lost through extractive activities. Okay, next slide. So what are some of the alternatives? This is something I talk about in the final chapter of my book. I said I was just going to talk about one chapter, but now I'm talking about all the chapters. But um, this is um, a picture that was I didn't take, but uh, was taken in 2009 when this was one of the first efforts of a green transition or what you know people were responding directly to the coal economy. So this is that other side of the carbon sovereignty where people are saying, we want to produce less carbon and in order to do that, we're going to be the we're going to be the origin of energy uh, renewable energy projects, and um, and so people marched onto the council. This is in Window Rock. Um, the Navajo Nation Council eventually passed two legislations: the Green Jobs Act, one that created a fund, and one created a commission to oversee monies coming from the Obama administration's America Reinvestment Re America Recovery Reinvestment Act. And to try to use those for like solar fields and power and, and wind farms or whatever. They also define green jobs broader than that. They were thinking about like going back to sheep herding or weavers co ops. And there's a whole range of activities that they called a green job. They said like our traditional work can be considered a green job. And so they were trying to expand the definition of that. I'm over there looking off into the corner, like a little bit lost. So, um, so that's why, yeah, I couldn't take the picture. Next slide. <laughs> Um, I, I use this mural a lot to emphasize that vision, that new ideology around coal and energy transition. And this is a mural that was painted in Tempe outside of, oh no, it's actually out of Phoenix, sorry, it's outside of ASU downtown. Um, and this was a mural that was painted at the same time, the same week that the Navajo Nation Council was deliberating on the re lease renewal for, the, for NGS. So those are earlier pictures I took of the coal workers that was happening at the same time. This mural was being painted at that same time. So I was driving a lot at that time, you know, between, between Phoenix and, and Window Rock. And, and so I, I witnessed, you know, these were all Dene and, and some Tanadam people putting this mural together. And I think what's interesting about these murals is they highlight, uh, they're, they're creating a critique on a, in a spatial relationship and that's not just chrono that's not just giving you a temporal accounting of like here's all the history of bad industries and now we're going into the future i think they're not doing that i don't think they're doing that future predicting stuff they're showing kind of a relationship between uh people in space and so what they do is a center in this case um who 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 are they centering here changing woman and um, and and you can't really see her here on this mural cuz i'm featuring the the, the panels and and that and actually behind her is the first man basket that's that's um, important for the Tanana people who are from uh, the Salt River Valley and down into uh, near Tucson too, and so this was kind of like an international intertribal uh, mural making where they're critiquing the history of coal right here on the left hand side. So you see the aquifer, the Black Mesa, the the that um, that that thing that it's not the slurry but the uh, that thing that was on the side of the road near Kent, I forget what that thing's called. <laughs> and then, of course, the rail lines and the power plant over here. And this this thing is supposed to represent CAP, the Central Arizona Project, bringing water into Phoenix for superficial purposes, for you know golf courses and that sort of thing. And on the right hand side, or uh, sorry, on the left hand side, you have uh, emphasized you know traditional crops with uh, sheep and 
and uh, solar and renewable energy technology. So they're saying that these things kind of work together and these things kind of work together. So it's a critique of this while idealizing that. So that's a new kind of vision of energy, you know, very different from what we saw from Norman Little 50 years prior. So I think it's interesting. It's showing a social change and it's showing how our energy is being redefined by new people. And this is 2013. And now a lot of these ideas have become part of our policy or part of the, a lot of the tribal makers think about these things when they're making decisions on energy development. Okay, next slide. Um, I created a quick uh, table of the different kinds of proposals uh, that were done over the last 20 years, some of the, and how they were alternative energy. So you have uh, Just Transition Co Coalition wanted solar fields on Black Mesa, Diné Care wanted wind farms throughout the reservation. The Green Jobs Technology wanted uh, wind, solar, and sheep herding and weavers co-op. So there's been a, a, um, a range of act in this. This is 2005, 2008, 2009, and so on. There's just been a, a range of uh, expanding the idea of energy and energy, alternative energy, primarily coming from environmental groups. So you see who the actual organizers are and the organizations involved in making those proposals. Now. What I think is really interesting is how this idea of energy transition started to circulate through tribal governance, through Window Rock, especially during the Ben Shelley administration. So <laughs> it's really interesting. Next slide. We'll show you what that all is. So you, how many of you have heard of Entech? Maybe some of you work for Entech. You work for Entech? Yes. All right. So we've got an Entech employee here. <laughs> so you can tell us more in detail. But this is our, uh, our former um, speaker, Lorenzo Bates with uh, the chairman of the, um, of the NTEC at the time, a former coal guy from Wyoming. And, and, and NTEC is really interesting because it has transition in its name. So it's taking the language of energy, uh, of alternative energy groups and employing it towards new uses of coal. So it's like the coal ideology, the self-determination through resource development thinking that's been a staple of tribal governments going back to the 1970s has reproduced itself through with this transition language to say we're moving beyond coal to a new kind of coal. And, uh, and interviews I've had with people, they're saying, even though the coal industry is collapsing, like what we saw from those charts at the beginning, we can think about future uses of coal, coal liquidification is one thing, uh, one of the technologies people were emphasizing to me, people who used to work for the Shelley administration. So they, in 2013, at the same time when this lease was being uh, renewed, it was passed by council, then SRP pulled out. Um, NTEC is created, is created to keep the Navajo mine open, but it's also trying to buy energy production in power plants. It's buying, generate, it's buying percentages of generating units. It's um, thinking about uh, capturing a larger vision of, of uh, revenue generating activities that goes back to the 1980s, that goes back to the creation of the Diné Power Authority in 1985. So this is a long-standing vision of the tribal government. We're finally able to realize it just as coal is collapsing. <laughs> but what's interesting is like, look at their chronology, look at their history. They're dating themselves back to the 1950s when the Navajo mine and coal lease was granted. So they're thinking about energy transition going back into the origin of the coal economy. They're defining themselves that way. That's what's really interesting. Okay, next slide. So this is a way that of expressing that same <laughs> idea, but coming from A. Hastin, our Navajo Times uh, cartoonist, who does a much better job at summarizing what's going on in the reservation than what I'm doing. And um, basically this is Lorenzo Bates when he's making, in this case, you know, he was a guy you saw making Entech but as he's decommissioning NGS, you know, he, they're seeing that he's trying to keep the coal economy alive because of these things. And these are the forces that we identified, revenues from coal, leads to the tribal government and jobs. But what the cartoonist is doing here is saying like, oh, this is an old industry represented by this dinosaur. So it's just a different way of expressing a lot of what I've already said. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what are some of the existing transition projects on the reservation? As far as I know, this is the only not uh, renewable energy technology on the reservation currently. And that's the, 20, the Kayenta solar field that opened in 2017. 
And what I think is really, again, I keep saying interesting, but I find all of this really interesting. But what I think is really interesting about this is this is something that didn't come out of the green jobs or any of the alternative proposals that I highlighted before. This was actually a creature of the, of the Navajo government, NTUA, that with SRP that helped to initiate this project. So what does this tell us? This tells us that those tribal institutions are still important. The authorities coming back from the uh, Indian Reorganization Act and the Indian Mineral Leasing Act are still important. And they are still the basis for how any kind of energy development is done on Indian land, including renewable energy technology. So there are efforts to try to circumvent the tribal government and work uh, in, uh, you know, work even just through the chapter house or through LGA. But to this day, the only successful approaches has been through things like NTUA or even NTEC. All right, next slide. So my concluding points are fossil fuels to find a particular brand, practice, and understanding of tribal sovereignty in a particular energy epoch, in a particular energy um, era, is basically what I'm saying, when energy was understood in a certain way. Like we showed you, that we contrasted the way that it was described in the 1960s with how the murals are portrayed in 2013. So, fossil, so our understanding of fossil fuels evolves over time. Alternative or renewable energy technology defined against fossil fuels or working, reworking this existing understanding and practice of tribal sovereignty, like those solar fields, like, those, like what that mural was saying. Okay, next slide. I think that might be over. So this, I just wanted to, to um, highlight some other books that talk a lot about, if you're interested in some of these topics, these are other people's books. Uh, my colleague Dana Powell, who uh, wrote Landscapes of Power, came out a few years ago. Andrew Needham's book on power lines, it talks about the history of energy infrastructure in the Southwest. You know, I draw a lot of my conclusions from reading these things. The New Deal and American Indian Tribalism, if you want to go back to understanding the IRA. Uh, Jennifer Danette uh, Dale's book, uh, Reclaiming Diné History, to think about how we challenge official historical narratives. I already mentioned this one, American Indian Policy in the 20th Century, the Navajos and the New Deal, and uh, for grazing and grazing districts, it's a little bit different from what I talked about, but that's uh, Dreaming of Sheep in Navajo Country by Martha uh, Marsha Weisinger. So these are some texts that you can refer to, or you can just buy this book, and I'm not selling them right now. <laughs> Thank you, that's it. Did I move away too far from the camera? Okay. Oh, right here. So, are there any questions from the audience or anyone on the Facebook? Mark? Yeah. Okay. Oh, can I just say yeah, that? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I didn't appreciate the emphasis on how Navajo cultures understand their labor in the coal economy um, using that specific Navajo concept that I don't want to say because I'm going to mess it up and I don't want to mess it up in the college. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're going um, to get, yeah. I was curious uh, in your interviews um, how the coal workers understood the coal market uh, and, and kind of a, a specific branch of that question is uh, did they speak in terms of profit or competition? Uh, that's a good question. Like you, what you're asking is like, how do coworkers under, excuse me, understand the way like resource economists think about these same issues? Right. And um, and um, I can't recall exactly what they said. Like I would have to review my transcripts. I don't remember a lot of people talking about the future markets of coal. I do think I ask about the future economic development. And like, is coal going to be something viable in the future? Coworkers were a little bit more reserved on that question, or they talked more directly about um, about um, you know the the particular benefits they get. I mean, I re do remember standing outside a council and asking about the water rights to uh, to somebody who was promoting coal, and I was like, well, you know, what do you think about in the lease that we're waiving thirty four thousand acre feet of water for another twenty five years? Uh, to the Navajo generating station, right? That's water that we can't access. And then they didn't know about that. They didn't know that feature of the lease. So then they just resumed, you know, here are the reasons why I support it, right? They just went back to what they knew and their experience, which makes sense. Uh, the only persons that I can say that was really predicting a future for coal in the way that you're talking about are tribal officials. 
So I don't think Lorenzo Bates would mind if I say that he was actually saying that like we have, because he's actually quoted in Navo Times actually, so it's public information, uh, um, saying that we have a hundred years worth of coal here on the reservation. And so we need to position ourselves to use it. And that's in 2013. So despite, so he's confounding these expectations, right? Despite this, we think that there will be another coal surge sometime, and we want to have the, the the infrastructure to take advantage of it. So, yeah, that's my answer. I had a follow-up question. Um, so you said that uh, the Navajo were able to translate the traditional values of a subsistence economy into uh, coal. And is there something uh, particular about coal that makes that possible? And is it true of other extraction economies that are <laughs> I think that's a, yeah, that's a really good question because it actually goes to an area where I didn't do enough research. And actually, Wendy and I were talking about this a little bit earlier about like masculinity and a gendered way of thinking about work. So I think there are certain work, I'm sp kind of speculating because I didn't really ask these questions, but there's a certain kind of work that's prioritized and a certain kind of work that's not prioritized, like the kind of, like a certain kind of labor that's valorized is a better way to put it. And so like labor that's physical in nature tends to get a lot of, get more acclaim. Either you're working in the coal mine or you're working in uh, construction or you're working in um, the military, you know, those kinds of things get a lot of praise. If you're like a bureaucrat or if you're working like what I do, <laughs> it doesn't get the same kind of, um, uh, the same kind of value or valorization, I think. Again, this is not something coming out of my research. This is just kind of broader observations. So this would be something interesting to think about how labor is gendered or has been gendered over time in the Navajo Nation. And it's been a particular project for um, the BIA and, or predecessor to the Office of Indian Affairs. Like, there's another book. I should have put it on the slide by Colleen O'Neill. It's called Working the Navajo Way. And she goes back into the early coal industry, like when people just had small mines. And she makes a linkage between how people had claims for grazing lands and how then they made claims for, for mining spots. These were not industrial mining activities. They're just like open pit, small mines, and they were just selling the coal to uh, the BIA, like to, in Gallup. They're like, here, you can, put, you can burn this in your stove. It wasn't a big market. It wasn't a big power plant. But they were working through coal, and it was it was a gendered labor. And eventually, when when um, when uh, the BIA was like trying to encourage wage labor, they were trying to create this gendered division of labor in the Navajo Nation. They were encouraging it in policy. Um, they were trying to get small mining operations to employ Navajo men specifically. So it wasn't open to Navajo women. It was something that then was learned over time between men and men. So like one of my interviewees, or more than one of my interviewees actually, had parents that worked in former uranium mines. Their former uranium mine site's not too far from Kayenta. So like, they're not, like their dads worked in the uranium mine and then they end up working in the coal mine. So I think that's what's interesting. So like if you look at it where you're just talking about one kind of energy industry, you'll kind of, you'll miss that that there's actually like it's reproduction of, of a, a, a gender labor that, that has been learned over time. Maybe there's something that's pre-BIA about it, but then a lot of the, 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 the emphasis on the male head of household is definitely coming out of BIA policy. So yeah. Sorry, I might have answered your question in a very different way. Other questions? Here's a Facebook question actually. Um, Davina May, she's asking, and this is more of a personal uh, question for you. It's just or, just curious, what organizations on Navajo do you help to support personally? We have many people who suffer from the effects of resource mining and continued efforts to resolve and clean up the mines. Besides research and education, how are you involved in fixing and preventing abuse from future energy transitions? Besides being Navajo, what are your personal ties and what made you want to pursue this type of research? There's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think let's go with the last one. Yeah, I like the last. I mean, I like all the questions, but yeah. 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 Okay, I'll go with the last one. Um, uh, when, when I was here at Diné College, uh, 2007, 2008, 
Um, that was when the tribal government was thinking about uh, getting a power plant built on the eastern end of the reservation near Burnham, the desert, the proposed Desert Rock power plant. So one of the things that we were looking at were were the cult, like how does like Diné fundamental law think about this? Like how does our traditional values think about this? And then how might in fact we wrote a whole like response to an EIS, an environmental impact statement. Uh, about that using like their like critiquing their ideas of cultural disruption and so um, anyway so that whole that whole like I, nexus of activities the Joe Shirley was promoting it Dene Power Authority was promoting it uh, Dene Care BMWC and some others were against it so there was like this 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 battle between you know the the two visions of of the Navajo Nation one that was like we're going to we're going to actually capture value from the coal industry. Like all of this time, we're just selling coal, and, and the and the value added is happening at the power plant. That's when it becomes energy and sold to cities. And then it's like for the first time, we're going to have that with this power plant. That was one vision. The other vision is we need to stop our continued participation in carbon intensive activities, and we need to do that now and with this particular project before it's built. So those are the two things that are happening. And when I was here, I was like, wow, this is a really important issue for us. This is like a an industry that structures our relationship with the outside world. And I want to understand something more about it. I feel like I felt like there needed to be more research in the area. And so that's how I started doing this project uh, was just witnessing that that set of debates uh, around the desert rock power plant that never was built. Yeah. I have a question that you might not know the answer to. Um, it's a math question. <laughs> Can I pass the mic to someone else? <laughs> Are you aware of or know of cold dust remediation? It seems to be an emerging technology at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk of that um, and work on that, like from former Appalachian mines. So there's, uh, uh, you know, when I, I used to live in North Carolina and I met a lot of people who were working in the Appalachian area thinking about coal dust, you know, the leftovers of coal um, production in those areas because it, the mining collapsed in Appalachia before it did in this area, like maybe a decade before that. So, um, so there's a long intensive work. Uh, Remediation is a, is a broad concept, and I think there's arguments about whether or not you can actually remediate the land. That's what we were talking about earlier about the toxicity of the land. Can this stuff be repaired? You know, it can meet certain standards uh, that the federal government dictates, uh, but can it be repaired in a way that we find acceptable? Those are broader questions. I didn't do my work on that, so this is as broad, about as much as I can answer to that. Mine was more focused on uh, the you know, what people were, how they were thinking about the industry at the time. Yeah. But those are important questions. Yeah. I'm sorry, just a quick comment. Yeah. Excuse me, like, like in uh, Southeast Ohio, along the ICW corridor, I forget the town, I forget the name of it. But, you know, there was a 14 mile stretch of nothing where they strip mine. Uh -huh. And I think it was the largest strip mining with the gem of Egypt, was the biggest strip mining machine, I think, in the universe. But what I know what you're talking about. They have a, they have like commemorations, this big shovel that used to be in Ohio. Yeah. But the interesting thing now is I can't even remember the name of the park. It's one of those safari parks now. Uh huh. They took like a big swath of that and then they turned it into exotic animals and uh -huh. safari tours and stuff like that. Like rehabilitated their. <laughs> So let's write that to Boo. <laughs> we got some suggestions. They had to cross over I 40. It seems like they had to cover I 40 with 14 feet of dirt. Uh huh. You know, like higher probably than this or whatever in order to, to save the road. Yeah. No, coming from, from Southeast Ohio, yeah. It, it, you know who would be good to talk about this is Stephen Etsidi from uh, Navajo EPA. I think this is like what he works on. So like, yeah, so that would be good. Anyway, yeah. It's kind of like a double standard question. All right, so being an end, you know, I don't know, it's more like this here and like, you know, having to catch up. Do you see the formidable future that possible that, you know, not, 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 not
the generation from to reduce you know for a lot of carbon and filtering going on Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think i think it's like we got to reframe the question somewhat so like a lot of the proposals are like um uh, about replacing one kind of energy technology with another and yeah and so what i'm i what me and others and actually i got this insight it's not my insight it's from one of the environment one of the work people who used to work for one of the environmental groups and she told me, and this is interesting gender division where a lot of the environmental groups are made of women. And then, you know, they're the ones that are doing all the, uh, the work to, to um, think about these envir long lasting environmental problems that, you know, that these industries uh, produce. So anyway, so she was telling me, like, if we just replace solar with, with um, or we replace coal with solar, but we keep the same kind of relationship that we have with the outside world, i.e. the utility companies like Salt River Project, we're still going to have that same kind of dependency. If they want to move to something else, we're going to be left with all of that. They're just going to shut it down, and move, just like what they did with coal. So should we just, should we think about the technology or should we think about the relationship? And I think that's more of a fundamental question. And what is our relationship with outside entities? These are built out of centuries of colonialism and it's not just like a broad idea of colonialism. Colonialism is very nefarious. It's like, it's, it moves around and you can't really see it all the time when it happens. And like some of the things I say in here is like our leases, just very mundane leases that we have between us in very dry language that only lawyers can interpret. That is a reproduction of colonial relationships. We do that, we agree to it in those kind of legal leases in that language. And so we need to be more aware of those things and we need to identify the different fault lines of colonialism. It's not just like here is a, the settlers coming in and taking our land. They're also negotiating rights to water, rights to subterranean mineral resources, casino compacts, a whole range of activities that are, that are colonial in nature. And so until we like start addressing those uh, structural inequalities between us, the state governments, even the county governments and the tribe, then, then we're going to still find ourselves in these same situations, uh, regardless of the technology or the particular development project in mind. So I think those are the more uh, important questions. Also, we, we, you know, Marley and I have talked a lot about land. We have long-standing land policy that locks everything up in a way that was coming from the from the conservation, uh, the Soil Conservation Service, thinking about desertification, irrigation that was benefiting outsiders, right? In fact, they were the ones doing a lot of the, the grazing, overgrazing with cattle and ranching outside of the reservation. We were more politically, we, we are politically less powerful than those interests. So whose livestock gets reduced, you know, in order to salvage the land for grazing? And those are the kinds of like interruptions into our economic activity that then we're still recovering from, right? There are grazing districts that are locked in are an economic intrusion in the 1930s. We still haven't recovered from that. And then yet we have another one and another one. And so until we start addressing those issues, I think it's hard to think of like some sort of, often we're thinking for the solution. Like I can't think of the phrase, but like the magic solution or like the thing that'll solve all of our problems. In fact, we just have to solve one problem at a time, I think is a problem. Yeah, anyway, that's not really an answer to your question, but it's about framing is how I see it. So I do see a lot of commentary, especially from Tony Khan, who works for at, with SRP. I promise you, everything you put SRP. Up, <laughs> in the book, I, I spent the past few days reading the book, so I would definitely um, um, <laughs> fact check his book if you want to do that. Um, so one more thing. <laughs> well, um, what do they want to say? I want to hear what they have to say. <laughs> so, they're going to sponsor another Diamondback game for us. <laughs> Thank so you, SRP. Now, we have a question from Emerson Begay, who's saying, who's asking, how is current Navajo Nation public health policy affecting or guiding the move to renewable energy resource development? And this will be our last question, by the way. Okay, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I got distracted by SRP. How is current Navajo Nation public health policy affecting 
or guiding the move to renewable energy resource development? That's a good question. Okay, so I don't really know the ongoing conversation about public health policy on the Navajo Nation. What I will say is that when the Navajo Council was passing uh, the legislation, if, in fact, it was like a research legislation to create NTEC, the Navajo Transitional Energy Company, um, we had to come up with $3 million, $3 million to hire a law firm to do an audit on the assets of Navajo Mine before we buy it. This is an LA uh, law firm. And, and so we needed, this was considered a due diligence study. And what was amended to that $3 million was like not only to do, uh, uh, not only to, to come up with a, the, a numerical money value for the assets at Navajo Mine, but also to, to do a public health research study, to think about the long-term effects for people, especially in Shiprock area, in Northern Agency, from decades of, of uh, power plant uh, uh, emissions, you know, from both the Four Corners Generating Station and the San Juan Generating Station. And that study, you know, this was something Dwight Witherspoon put in, so Council Delegate Witherspoon, that study was, I don't think, was adequately resolved. That was part of the reason why NTEC was like allowed to exist. And then what the lawyers produced was just, an, uh, a, cons was just a report of existing studies. They didn't do a new study. So to this day, we don't have that information that was requested by the council when we created NTEC. So I think that's part of the problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, apparently, can someone, um, Amori, actually, um, she'll be asking another question. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you encountered any hurdles relating to the data I've been learning more about like within the government, like institutions, either gathering or serving that kind of information and. As it relates to your research, do you run into any hurdles dealing with that, and how do you? Uh, data and statistics. Um, well, fortunately, I don't do that kind of work. <laughs> so I just did interviews. Um, but no, there's a real, uh, there's a real uh, difficulty getting uh, data from the tribal government. Okay, so there's a, a, there was a couple of instances. I actually described this in the book where I was like in a meeting where I was trying to overhear what at that time the attorney general for the Navajo Nation was going to say, give it, issue a report on some of the legal questions involved with the lease renewal and some other things. And uh, this became a closed door meeting. So a lot of these, this lease renewal, which I think is a public interest question for the Navajo people, was closed and, and, and considered off limits from our from us understanding based on uh, a privacy act. It's in our Navajo Nation co code. It's called uh, Privacy and Information Access Act. And it's really supposed to protect Navajo employees from, you know, their information getting out there. But this particular act or this particular law in our code was interpreted to protect Navajo Nation lease negotiations with like a very inconsequential lease negotiations with a utility for the extension of a 25 year lease, which has bearing on our water access, right? So like those things were kept out of our public discourse by the use of this privacy act. So that was one of the barriers, you know, and that's common. That's not just this instance. Our tribal government will sometimes be a public government and sometimes be a corporation and corporations don't have any responsibility to disclose their, their information. A lot of that stuff was saying, a lot of the justification was saying, we don't be like, for example, with NTEC, we don't need to, we can't put that stuff out there publicly because that's secrets by BHP Billiton. We don't, we don't want to know what, if they release asking price to us as a Navajo nation, that's going to influence, that's going to have bearing on their corporate, whatever, you know, with other companies. What does that have to do with us? You know, why should we be concerned about the welfare of BHP Billiton? We need to know if we're making, if the decisions that the tribal government is making is in the interest of the Navajo people. But the way it's interpreted is we're defending corporate secrets. And, um, and you know, to me, I think that's kind of against the reading of the Privacy Act, as I understand it. But I'm not a Navajo Nation attorney. I don't work in Window Rock, so I don't know. <laughs> you can get them to come here and argue why that's the case. <laughs> Great job, Dr. Curley. Um, so we did, off, we're offering a free book, folks. If you do sign up 
on our sign-in sheet um, because I know uh, Dr. Curley couldn't bring books because of the quick turnaround and delivery time. So um, I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, she's coming around the Board of Regents. Um, Jalen is coming around with a sign-in sheet. So make sure to put your mailing address on there just in case uh, you're not a student here. Um, we also have a survey for folks that we would like for you to complete because as we progress through these um, speaker series, but also through this fellowship um, initiative, we do want to get a lot of feedback in terms of how we can improve these sessions, but also to make it more accessible. Say that again. Okay. So I just want to also give a warm thank you to everyone who's been involved with organizing this, this session. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, President Dr. Charles Monty Russell for being here and supporting this initiative. So great job. Thank you. Um, dean Carla Britton, who is the Dean for the School of Arts and Humanities, and she actually oversees this fellowship and has really been really instrumental in helping us think through speakers and the goals of this grant. I also want to give a warm thank you to Kayla Jackson. She's really been very, very wonderful in helping to organize these talks um, and doing a lot of the back end work, but also being our director, <laughs> producer, creative designer for the podcast, um, which we'll go ahead and pull up the the QR code. But I also want to just send a warm thank you to Provost Alyssa Landry, um, as well as uh, Dr. Andrea Cristal, who's the Vice President for Research, um, but also to Dylan Nopa, who's connecting us on Facebook Live, and Hansel, and I think Hansel said Gretel. <laughs> what were you saying? What was your last name? You were saying Hansel. What is it? <laughs> He was telling me Hansel and Gretel, so I wasn't sure um, if that was his really last his really last name. Sorry about that. Um, so our next book talk is on November or December fifth on Tuesday. We have Ezra Ros Rocher coming, and he wrote A Nation Within: Navajo Land and Economic Development. Um, although he's not Navajo, he did grow up in Kianta, Arizona, and he is a uh, Monument Valley High School Mustang. So. <laughs> Give him a little like shout out. But I want to thank everyone. Um, if you um, want to buy Andrew's book, his book is $30 um, for the paperback. But please um, check out our podcast. This We did do a podcast earlier today. Um, it does take about a week or two to um, load up. But we do have Dr. Lloyd Lee um, from our previous talk, as well as our conversation with the leadership of Diné College. So. Um, talking about the, the project itself, but and thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. <laughs>